We'll read verse 5 and verse 6. You prepare what? A table before me in the presence of mine. You anoint my head with, and my cup does what? Or runs over. For surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord because there's an anointing upon my life. There's an anointing upon my life, so the goodness of the Lord shall follow me. Let's flip over to the New Testament, or before we go to the New Testament, let's read Isaiah chapter 10, verse 27. Isaiah chapter 10, verse 27. Want to go. It shall come to pass in that day that his burden shall be taken away from off thy shoulder and his yoke from off your neck, for the yoke shall be destroyed by reason of what? Because of the anointing. Some translations say because of the anointing all. Because of the anointing all. Now let's flip over to Acts chapter 10, verse 38. Every believer, that is a passage that every believer should commit to memory. Acts chapter 10, verse 38. How God anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth with what? With the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. It's a message I will dilate some other time but um, just because this is the prelude to Easter, I, since I'm not doing a series, I just want to preach on this message, the value of the anointing. What is the anointing, when we talk about anointing, the word anointing in the Bible, in its context, means to smear. To smear is to dap, to soil. It's like to pour oil on somebody. When we talk about the anointing, we're talking about the anointing oil. To pour oil on somebody, to smear somebody. We use that phrase, smear. We call it, in politics, they call it smear campaign. When they want to mess up your reputation, they want to mess up your name, they want to mess up your history, what do they do? They smear you. They pour dirt on your testimony. They pour dirt on the story of your life. So the word anointing, is in its direct biblical application, means to smear, to pour something on you. But this time, you got dirt by the Holy Spirit. You adapt with the Holy Spirit. You are besmirched with the Holy Spirit. There is a splatter of the Holy Spirit. The anointing oil represents the anointing of the Holy Spirit. The oil of God represents the Holy Spirit coming upon you. Now, in the Old Testament, the anointing, the anointing, the people who were anointed specifically were three categories of people. And that also spoke about the people who carried the presence of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. First, the priests were anointed, and then later on, it became just the high priest who was anointed because he was the only one who carried the presence of the Holy Spirit. The priest, the high priest. And then the other people who were anointed were prophets. Prophets were anointed. When a prophet is leaving, he anoints a succeeding prophet. There was, there was a call in the times of Elijah, there was something called the school of the prophets. Every prophet there was anointed in order to enter into the office because the, of, the, 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 the function of a prophet is an office. It's a specific office. The designation of a prophet is an office. Don't mind the people who go around here today. Everybody is a prophet. In fact, there's one of these countries in Africa. Almost every minister is a, is a prophet. If you see a flyer, prophet this, prophet a bimpami, prophet in the middle. You know, prophet, everybody is a prophet. But to be a prophet was an office. And it is indeed, even in the Old Testament, it's an office. You received a specific anointing from the Holy Ghost, from God Almighty, to be a prophet. And then the other people who were anointed were kings. If you know, the, you remember the story, First Samuel chapter 16, when uh, David was going to become king, what happened? He was anointed. He was specifically anointed. Saul was first anointed, then David was anointed. It took him about 13 years before he rose into, he occupied the office of a king, but you are anointed. But in the New Testament, you as a believer, you are anointed by the presence of the Holy Spirit. There's an indwelling power of the Holy Spirit or indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. But beyond that, you also receive an anointing. So the concept of the anointing 
in the New Testament is a consistent and continuous process. And I will tell you, I will explain that. Application, applicability of the anointing. You are, the anointing can come upon you for healing. James chapter 5, it says that if any sick among you, let him call for the, for the elder. Let them do what? Anoint him with all and let them pray over him. For the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. James chapter 5 from verse 14. Is anyone sick among you? Let him call the elders. Let him pray over him and anoint him with all. For the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. Anointing also comes on you for authority. You receive an authority from God. When God anoints you, he imparts an authority upon your life. He releases an authority upon your life. So tonight, this date, for instance, there's going to be an anointing service. When we anoint you, we are releasing a new level of authority upon your life. And your authority is not just in the physical. First, the work of God is done in the spiritual, and then it translates in the physical. So you're anointed in the spiritual, and then you manifest in the physical. Can somebody say amen? Yeah. This is church. Look at somebody and say, this is church. This is church. This is church. This is church. Anointing can also come upon you for gladness. The Bible says in Hebrew chapter 1, I think verse 9, the Bible says that how God anointed Jesus. No, no. He said, he said thou hast anointed him with the oil of gladness. You're anointed with the oil of gladness. It brings gladness upon your life. So the re a release upon of anointing upon your life, and suddenly a weight is lifted off of you. Depression disappears. Heaviness disappears. Even when you are facing a dismal and difficult situation, you just realize that in the face of that opposition, there's joy flowing in your heart. There's gladness. Why? Because there is a release of something supernatural upon your life that gives you strength and gives you superior understanding and insight and knowledge over your adversity and over your opposition. Oh, tell somebody, this is church. This is church, so you've got to be excited. Anointing also sets you apart. The anointing of the Lord is for consecration, where you are set apart. We're not going to read those passages, but in um, Exodus 29, verse 7, Exodus 30, 30, the Lord told Moses, he said, anoint Aaron and his sons. There will be priests priest and high priest, anoint them so that they can be set apart. They can be consecrated. They can be set apart for me. The anointing of God upon your life today will set you apart. You know, the Bible says that touch not my anointed and do my prophets no harm. When the devil sees the anointing upon you, he knows that thus far he can come and no further. A thousand shall fall by your side and ten thousand by your right hand, but they shall not come near you. Amen. I want to say amen for myself. Amen. 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 Amen for myself. The anointing also brings respect. It brings validation and it brings respect. I think that's a passage we should read. Luke chapter 7. Let's see that. Luke chapter 7. The anointing of God will bring respect over your life. It will validate you and it will bring respect over your life. Some of you have been dealing with shame and ignominy, ignominy and disrespect and contempt. The anointing of God today will bring respect over your life in the name of Jesus Christ. It will bring validation upon your life. Luke chapter 7, verse um, 40. Yep, let's start from verse 44. Verse 44. From verse 44. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, See us thou this woman. A woman, Jesus Christ, went into the house of Simon, a man who had been healed of leprosy, one of the top leaders in his days. And this woman came there and anointed his feet with oil. You know the story, the alabaster oil. Anointed his feet and she was crying and weeping and wiping his feet with her hair. And the, the man, Simon, turned and got angry. And Jesus said, look, 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 look. Don't get angry with this woman. He said, I entered in your house. You did not give me water for my feet. She has washed my feet with her tears. She wiped them with the hair of her head. The next verse, he said, wherefore I say to you, her sins which are many are forgiven. For she loved, she loved much, but to whom little is given, forgiven the same love a little. Next verse, please. He says, and she said, he said, and he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Next verse, next verse, next verse. He said, and I sat and the... Let me read from my Bible, please. He said, you gave me, verse 45, he said, you gave me no keys, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came into your house. Verse 46, he says, you did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with ointment. When a visitor comes into a house, Part of the way to show respect, to show honor, to show appreciation on that visitor is to anoint the person. So when the anointing all comes upon you, it can give you respect. It can give you honor. It can set you apart. If you look at how Saul was anointed, when Saul was anointed, 
honor came upon him. He became a different person. The Bible says that when he walked away from Samuel, his heart became a different heart. He became a different person. It is not so much what is outside you that determines the glory that covers your life as much as what is inside you. It is what is inside you that determines what covers you with glory. Amen. So when God is inside you, that's why the Bible says that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the it is what is inside you. In the world, it is what is outside you that determines your authority. For instance, a policewoman, five feet, two inches, or five feet, no inches, will require a police uniform and a gun in order to show, in order to attract the respect and the authority of a, of a, a law enforcement officer. Without that uniform, you take her just as a regular civilian. But with the uniform, external manifestation, external endowment determines who she is by virtue of authority and the honor that she attracts. But in the kingdom of God, it is what is inside of you that determines what honor and what authority you attract. It's what is inside of you. Inside of you. So, the anointing gives you honor. It gives you honor. It is what is inside of you. It builds up something inside of you. Look at someone and say, oh, no, no, no. Raise up your hand and say, Lord, put something inside of me. Lord, put something. Put, I need something inside of me. Something different. Something supernatural. Something, something glorious. Something divine from you. So, number one, the anointing will make you valuable. The anointing will make you valuable. Last Sunday and the Sunday before last and the one before last, I talked about how knowledge... It's a product of information. And how skill is a product of knowledge. Skill will make you efficient, but no more. Skill cannot make you valuable. Skill will only make you efficient. I want you to listen this morning. Listen very closely and listen because this is a message of destiny for somebody here today. It's a message of destiny. Skill will make you efficient, but skill will not necessarily make you valuable. Skill will make you efficient, but skill will not necessarily make you valuable. And I will explain that in a minute. You can be skillful, but not be beneficial because you are not valuable. You are skillful, but you are not beneficial. You are not needed. You are not valuable. You can be skillful, but you are not beneficial. And I will explain that in a minute. For instance... Let's, let's, let's use these examples. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Shehu is a keyboardist, right? Great keyboardist. Shehu shows up in this church, and by the time he shows up, he's a maestro of, of, of a monumental dimension. But by the time he shows up, we have three other maestros who can play keyboard. And our lack is a bass guitarist. So, Shehu is skillful, but is he needed? Oh, talk to me, somebody. So, you can be skillful, but you're not needed. And that's why some of you wonder why you have so much skill, why you have so much competence. But at a point in time, people do not seem to validate whatever endowment you have. So what the anointing does is that the anointing now makes you needed with your skill. The anointing now makes you, what the anointing does is that it will align your skill with the need of the community. Or the anointing will create a need so that your skill becomes needed. Are you with me? Are you following what I'm saying? This message is a message for one person here this morning. He now creates a need where your skill becomes needed. Your neededness, your valuableness, your beneficialness is not dependent on your age. Let me say that repeatedly. It is not dependent on your 
age. Jesus Christ was done by the time he was 33 years old. 33 years old, he was done and gone. John the Baptist, 33 years old, by the time John was 34, he was gone. Ministry had been completed. Young people are valuable, and the people say, Amen. Young people, because they are eclectic, they know how to, they know how to, <laughs> to reframe their skills to meet the need of the environment. They meet the need per time, the need of the moment. Young people, but we all this, we are fossilized like the dinosaur. I like that, my sister. No way. Amen. Because <laughs> the Bible says that even in old age, you should still be producing fruits. So you should be eclectic. You should move with the time. You should change. Jesus Christ was done. David was anointed at age 17. A young man, a teenager, correct? Joseph was prime minister by 30. 30. Bill Clinton was governor of Arkansas by 32. He was attorney general of the state by 28. The president of France is 37 years old. I think now he should be 38, 39. And his wife is 65. No, true, true story. The wife is 25 years older than him. And they've been having, they've been, they've been carrying on wonderful romantic relationship. Because I hear some of you sisters say, ah, I'm not going to marry a man who is older than me. And I'll say, how old is he? He says, he's six months older than me. I'm not going to marry him. <laughs> you know, why, why I decided to drop that point, that point, that age thing, is because you know, as we're preparing for my, you know, celebration, 60th birthday celebration, I was going through pictures, my childhood pictures. I was going through some of them, going through some of them. And I saw some of the pictures when I was 21. 21. I went to interview the deputy governor of my state. I went alone. Not with anybody. Got a radio, went to the newspaper, got a newspaper cameraman, followed me to the governor's office. We sat down there. The picture is there in my house. Come, I'll show you. Pictures do not lie. I was 21. I was 21 when I was general prefect of my school. When the principal addresses the school, and we had over a thousand students, when the principal addresses the school, and I do not address the school, nobody leaves the assembly ground, including teachers. They stood there and they listened to me. 21. 21, we're breaking grounds. I was president of press club, editor-in-chief of my school magazine, president of science club, president, president. I was, I've been doing this president thing for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> Now, why am I saying that? In this church, let us allow the young people to flourish. Where are the young people now? I don't know. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Let's allow the young people to flourish. Because your valuableness is not dependent on your age. And the people say, it is what is in you that determines the honor upon you that goes out of you. What is in you? Not the number on your birth certificate. And the reason why this is important, my brethren, is because there's another level of anointing or valuableness that is dependent, not necessarily by what is placed on you, but by what you build in your inside. Let me show you one or two Bible passages and then we'll go on. Um, Numbers chapter 27, verse 18, very quickly. Numbers 27, 18. Oh boy, not 27, 18. Are we there? Can we have it quickly? And the Lord said to Moses, Take Joshua, the son of Nun, with you, a man in what? Can we open your mouth? Choir members, open your mouth. A man in the spirit, and the spirit is already in him. Do you see that? Before the laying on of hands, which was also a type of the impartation or the release of the Holy Ghost. There was already a spirit in him. There was already an anointing in him. So the anointing that came by the laying on of Moses' hand was just to activate what was already in him. 
That's what Paul said. Paul wrote to Timothy. He said, do not let any man despise your youth. He said, but stir up the gift that is inside of you. May God stir up that gift inside of you in the name of Jesus. I'll show you another passage. Another one, Daniel chapter 5 verse 11. Daniel 5 verse 11. Daniel 5 verse 11. There is a man in the kingdom. That's not the one I want to show you. Oh yeah, that's it. There is a man in your kingdom in what? In whom is the spirit of the holy God. Daniel was not a king. He was not a prophet. He was not a priest. Even though he was a kind of prophet. But there's no way in scriptures where we are told that hands were laid on him. Where we are told that the oil was poured on his head. But there was a development. You can develop an anointing inside of you. You can develop an anointing inside of you. So that when, that's what happened to John the baptizer. He was in the wilderness until the day of his manifestation was revealed. He allowed God to develop an anointing inside of him. In the place of personal devotion, in the place of personal prayer, in the place of personal intercession, in the place of personal worship, the anointing of God developed inside of him. May God develop an anointing inside of you. So when the anointing develops inside of you, regardless of your age, regardless of your age, in your 80s, you'll be effective. In your 90s, you'll be effective. In your 70s, you'll be effective. In your 40s, you'll be effective. In your 20s, you'll be what? Effective. I pray for you today. May you be effective in the name of Jesus. So, do not be content with your gift or skill. Do not be content. Your skillfulness, do not be content. Ask God to make you beneficial. Matthew chapter 4 verse 19. Peter was a fisherman. Peter was a fisherman. God told him. He says, hey Peter, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. He was a fisher. Fisher of fishes. God says, I will make you fishers of men. God aligned his gifts with the need in the kingdom and make him a fisher of fishes, of men. Peter could speak. You remember? He was a guy who could talk even when he was not asked a question. And Peter answered. And Peter answered. If you check the Bible, all the time that Peter spoke alone is more than all the time all the other apostles, other apostles put, spoke, put together. The time that Peter spoke alone, Peter answered. Peter answered. Peter answered. And Peter said, answered. Let us build three, 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 um, three tabernacles. Who asked you a question? There are people like that. You have a gift of talking. You have a gift of talking. So what did God do? God aligned that gift by the anointing and he became a spokesman for the kingdom. Do you understand? All good and perfect gifts come from above. So your gift of talking is not wasted. Just allow God to align it. Your gift of cursing is not wasted. Allow God to align it. It will become a gift of blessing. Amen. <laughs> Are you with me, brethren? Your gift will become a gift of blessing. You become a blessing to people. When you open your mouth, instead of swearing and cursing and using words that nobody wants to hear, you will bless them with your words. People, beautiful women, have been considered ugly without the grace to be beautiful. You agree with me? You see a woman who, you know, I, I'm not somebody who defines people as like beauty or not beautiful because beauty is always in the eye of the beholder. You can't say this one is beautiful, this one is not beautiful. No. But you've seen physicality in some people, the contours of their face is so smooth and so well coordinated that you say, Kai! So God made this. But despite that, this kind of women have been beaten to pulp by their spouses. Because the husband does not see any beauty in this wonder, seventh wonder of the world. Why? Because she does not have the grace, the anointing of being beautiful. And you see a woman who you look at and you say, ah. <laughs> and yet, the husband comes to a meeting, or a public meeting like this, and says, oh, I'm married to the most beautiful woman in the world. <laughs> Why? Because there's a grace, there's an anointing of beauty on the person. Are you with me, brethren? 
I hope I'm making sense. I'm, I'm about to finish the message because I want to annoy people now. Because look at, we don't have the time, but look at the story of Esther. Esther. Esther was one of many women, remember, who was brought to the king, Vashti. And the Bible says that these were the best of the beauties in the land. Now, the difference between them and Esther was that an oil, special oil was given to Esther by Haggai. Remember, I told you this last Sunday. Haggai, the eunuch. And that Esther was applying that oil. That oil. She applied that oil repeatedly. Not once, not twice. So some of you who are saying that, eh, I was anointed last Sunday or last month. Why must I be anointed again? No. Look at someone and say, one time is not enough. She applied it repeatedly, 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 repeatedly. Now, brethren, you must understand that the other women who went to see the queen were also beautiful. I went to see the king were also beautiful. But none of them were attracted by the king. So that's why I meant by saying that your skill, your beauty, your, 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 your what do you call it? Your performance, your giftedness does not necessarily translate to your being valuable. It is the anointing of God on you that will elevate you, that will open doors for you, that will make you honorable, that will make you respected, that will make people give you what is not even your due. And when they do it, they do it with pleasure. Even though they may regret later on, but you've taken your thing and ran out of the door. So that's what we are praying today. That's what we are trying to do here today. That God will bring a new anointing upon you. When Esther stood before the king, the man looked at her and said, my goodness, this is the most beautiful thing I've seen in the world. May God release that anointing upon your life. That will confuse people when you stand before them. That will make people open their vault and give you their treasures without them knowing why. It's the anointing of God. It's the anointing of God, brethren. It's a, that's why I, 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 you know, I was talking to one of our leaders the other day. You know, he came to see me and he was telling me, oh, pastor, I want to do this. I want to do that. I want to do that. I said, no, honey, sit, sit down in the office. I said, no, these things you want to do are good. But these methods do not translate to success. It may give you success, but temporarily mechanical success. That when you move into the realm of the spirit and you allow God to give you a supernatural capability, it opens a door for you that man cannot stop. He gives you favor that man cannot oppose. God gives you a new anointing. I want to pray for you in this church. Brethren, let us seek that anointing that comes from God. That beauty, that glory that comes from God. That honor that comes from God. That will translate everything else around your life. That will make people favor you. It is the favor of God. It is the favor of, listen to me brethren, it is the favor of God. The anointing will bring that favor. The anointing will bring that favor. I am praying for you today. May God give you an anointing that will bring favor upon your life in the name of Jesus Christ. That the things you are struggling for, God will put it on your, on your plate easily and very easily and inexpensively. May God bring people into your life because of that anointing, the anointing of favor. May God open doors for you because of the anointing of favor. May God give you treasures that you do not deserve because of the anointing of favor. I declare over your life today, may God release it upon you in the name of Jesus Christ. I declare over you today, do not receive this anointing in vain. Anything in you that will reject the anointing, I break it in the name of Jesus Christ. May the anointing crush every opposition. May the anointing crush every resistance. May the anointing crush every ugliness. May the anointing crush every rebellion in the name of Jesus. May the anointing crush every demonic resistance in the name of Jesus. I release an anointing upon you today that will destroy foundations that have not been established by God. That will repair the bridges in your life. An anointing that will open new doors. An anointing that will create a bridge. That will take you from nothingness into somethingness. From obscurity to notoriety. From poverty to riches. From lack to abundance. I release an anointing upon you today. May favor break out over your life. 
May men see you and want to do you good. May the people that hate you turn around and begin to bless you. I release an anointing upon you today that God Almighty by Spirit will heal you. He will heal you. He will heal you. He will make you strong in the places of your weaknesses. May that anointing make you strong in the name of Jesus. In the places where you are not honored, I declare today may the anointing in your life and upon your life make you needed. Make it impossible for them to ignore you. The anointing that will make it impossible for them to ignore you. They may not like you, but they cannot ignore you. They may hate you, but they cannot ignore you. They may dislike you, but they cannot ignore you. They will see you and they will know that this is different. They will see you and they will know that this is not the work of a man. I release that anointing upon you today in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Anointing, fall on me. Anointing, fall on me. Anointing, let it fall. 